By the mid-1990s, Williams Trains had become a major player in the O-Gage three-rail train market, producing a wide variety of colorful, reliable, and economically priced locomotives and cars. Colorful, flywheel-equipped twin-motored diesels with a true blast horn and bell sounds were standard fare on their products, so hobbyists knew exactly what to expect when they opened a Williams box. In the 1980s, however, when Williams was just getting started making new O-Gage three-rail items, things were not quite so consistent. Yes, the trains were still well-built, solid runners, and economically priced for the era, but there were many production variations in these models that hobbyists should be aware of when purchasing a Williams locomotive from this era. I recently acquired this pair of early Williams FP45 diesels, a powered and a dummy, for a bargain price, and they are perfect examples to show the variations one may find in Williams products of the era. It's best to say, expect the unexpected. One of the earliest O-Gage models produced by Williams in the 1970s was their reproduction of Lionel's Fairbanks Morse Trainmaster. With two powerful Pittman or Mabuchi motors, the Williams model was an excellent puller and was priced below the market price of Lionel's post-war versions at the time. As a small batch manufacturer, Williams was free to experiment with their models, and they were sometimes required to improvise when third-party components were not available. In addition to the previously mentioned Pittman vs. Mabuchi motors, some versions had QSI electronic reverse units, while some had none at all and were wired for forward operation only. There is a slot in the locomotive frame to accommodate Lionel reverse unit levers if the user wants to add one. Some models had traction tires, some had a version of magnetic traction, and some relied upon the weight of the locomotive only. As a result, hobbyists should be aware that these models should be priced less than the later 1990s and 2000s versions. The train masters were successful, however, and Williams considered new models that could be built using the train master frame and drive. In or around 1984, Williams introduced an SD45 model. This was not intended to be a true scale model, as it shared the train master frame, drive, and trucks, but it was close enough to scale for those who were accustomed to Lionel's Jeeps and U-boats at the time. As with the early train masters, there were a number of variations in the motors, traction tires, and reverse units on these early SD45s. Later SD45 models feature more appropriate EMD-style truck frames. Next, in or around 1987, came the Williams FP45 model. In the real world, only 15 FP45 locomotives were built in 1967 and 1968, for passenger service on the Santa Fe and Milwaukee Road. Similar-looking F-45 freight diesels were also made for Santa Fe, Great Northern, and Burlington Northern, and some later found their way to Montana Rail Link, Wisconsin Central, and Susquehanna. Similar-looking passenger versions also include Amtrak's 150 SDP-40F diesels and a handful of Milwaukee Road F-40Cs built for Chicago commuter service. First, let's look at this powered FP45 model. This is a very early Williams FP45. Under the hood, we see a pair of Bobucci can motors without flywheels. These motors are reliable and the locomotives are great pullers, but the lack of flywheels mean that these will stop on a dime, which is not so great with a long train in tow. The frame, drivetrain, and trucks are borrowed from the Williams Trainmaster diesel as a means of saving costs on new tooling. Only the earliest examples of the FP45s have these plastic Trainmaster trucks. They are fairly common on the SD45 models, however, which started production earlier in the 1980s. This model features what appears to be a QSI electronic reverse unit. You can see the slot for a user-supplied Lionel reverse unit here. The original foam under the reverse board has deteriorated over the past four decades, so I added new double-sided weather stripping tape to secure the board. Only a single headlight is supplied on this model. There is a brass cylinder for weight attached to the frame. Generally, versions with traction tires have a single weight, while those without traction tires have two weights. 
Here you can see the traction tires and, well, where one tire is missing. Luckily, I have some extra tires that came with my later production Williams GP7 that are a perfect fit. To replace the tire, I used this long dental tool to push one side of the tire down to the bottom of the wheel. I unscrewed one side of the truck frame. The other screw is inaccessible without removing the motors, which I did not want to do at this point. Loosening the side frame gave me just enough wiggle room to properly seat the tire around the wheel. And ta-da, we're ready to work again. Notice how the inside wheels have no flanges, which allows for operation on 031 curves. The Blake wheels on this version are plastic. There is also a plastic fuel tank on this model. Due to overhang, I recommend 042 curves as kind of a minimum for these models for looking good. But you can run them on 031. The shell is a decent representation of an FP45, although the nose is too short, which is necessitated by the location of the motor. Note that the decoration is minimal, with Amtrak spelled out, but with no logo. I'm also surprised by these unusually large headlight lenses. They do appear to be factory original. Mine came without handrails as well, and I don't know if it was delivered that way or if they were removed by a previous owner. I removed the front handrail from my second model and added it to the rear of this one, making it better resemble a real Amtrak SDP-40F, as they had no front handrails. My dummy locomotive sports the same road number, but note the differences. First, an Amtrak logo was applied. The horns changed from black to silver, and the trucks changed from plastic Trainmaster side frames to metal EMD style, actually making this dummy heavier than my powered sample. The headlights now look more realistic, but the, the rear lenses were missing. But the glue residue tells me that they were once present. Underneath, the vertical pickup rollers on the powered unit have been replaced by these angled pickups, which operate much smoother. The blank axles on this version are now metal. The frame has also changed from aluminum to black, and the fuel tank is now metal instead of plastic. Removing the shell, we now see two headlights and an electronic horn. This is not the true blast horn of the later versions. This horn sounds more like a malfunctioning grocery price scanner, and it is really loud. I am swapping the shells on my models so that the better decorated version will now be the powered model. I'll probably add my own Amtrak decal to the other shell later. The mounting holes on the two shells are identical. On the layout, the pair runs great. The powered unit has more than enough strength to handle my post-war super speedliner cars, along with the heavy dummy locomotive. I've had no derailment issues on my 042 curves or turnouts, although the vertical pickups on the powered unit are very noisy on the turnouts. Just be careful when slowing and stopping, as these motors will stop spontaneously when the power drops too low. If you're reenacting Amtrak operations, the aluminum streamlined cars are the best match. Amfleet and Superliner cars operated with head-end power rather than steam heat, and so they were incompatible with Amtrak's SDP-40F diesels. As I mentioned before, the SDP-40F locomotives had no front porch or handrails, so I removed my handrails. Both the front and back porches on these models are extremely short anyway, so the lack of handrails is actually somewhat of a visual improvement. The only other visual differences between FP45s and SDP40Fs are the trucks, the positions of some ladders, and the FP45s have portholes, while the SDP40Fs did not. In the real world, FP45s and their cousins were largely successful in operation, but were hampered by outside events. The oldest FB-45s were barely four years old when Amtrak took over America's inner-city passenger service. With no more passenger trains to haul, they were relegated to freight service. Milwaukee Road's five FP-45s were scrapped in the early 1980s. 
Santa Fe's, on the other hand, were rebuilt and soldiered on in freight service up until the BNSF merger in the mid-1990s, along with the F-45s that had not already been sold or scrapped. Milwaukee Road's F-40C diesels soldiered on with Metra, hauling Chicago commuters into the early 2010s. The saddest batch were Amtrak's 150 SDP-40Fs. Ordered new in 1973, by late 1975, the diesels were blamed for a number of derailments. While a single specific cause was never determined, the location of the diesel's interior water tanks was thought to be a prime culprit, along with the unique hollow bolster trucks on the models and the massive weight of the locomotives. By 1977, SDP-40Fs were being traded in to EMD for new four-axle F-40PH locomotives. Some were sold to Santa Fe, which rebuilt them for freight service. The last SDP-40Fs had been removed from Amtrak's roster by the mid-1980s. In the hobby world, later versions of the Williams FP-45 with flywheel-equipped motors, true blast sounds, and metal EMB-style trucks are usually found for sale in the $150 to $200 range, depending on condition and road name. When properly identified as earlier models like these, the price generally falls to between $75 and $100, again, depending on condition and the road name. Be careful, especially when buying online, as it is difficult to tell from photos alone what vintage these models might be, except when Trainmaster trucks are present. My pair did have a few issues, such as the missing handrails, a broken coupler knuckle, which I easily replaced, and no boxes were included. Still, I consider the $75 I paid for the pair, not each, but both, to be a steal. Go to your local train shows. That's where the bargains can be found. So, while these early Williams diesels may not be as nice as their later products, with no flywheels on the motors, inferior sound, and somewhat less detail, for the price of an MPC-era Jeep 7 or U36, you get something less ordinary and with great pulling power. While these six-axle units won't operate on 027 curves, if you have 031 and larger, consider adding an early Williams Trainmaster SD45 or FP45 to your roster. As always, I hope you enjoyed this video as much as I enjoyed making it, and if so, please like the video, subscribe, and tell us your favorite Williams products. Keep the trains running, and we'll see you on the next episode of Toy Train Tips and Tricks.